Welcome to episode 70 of the Energy Balance Podcast, where we teach you how to live without constant hunger and cravings, fatigue, brain fog, poor sleep, and other low energy symptoms by maximizing your cellular energy. I'm Jay Feldman. I'm a health coach and independent health researcher. And joining me again today is my good friend, Mike Fave. Mike and I have been studying health and nutrition together for a long time now. And Mike also draws on his experiences from working within the healthcare industry. Today's episode is part eight, our final part of our series discussing non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And in today's episode, we'll be focusing on pro-metabolic supplements for fatty liver disease. Throughout this series, we've been discussing the general mechanisms and physiology underlying this disease process. And so if you haven't listened to the earlier episodes of this uh, series, I'd highly recommend you go back and do so. In today's episode in particular, we'll be discussing the optimal amount of exercise for fatty liver disease, how stress impacts fatty liver disease and basic ways to reduce stress, supplements that help the liver clear fat to reverse fatty liver, the best supplements for raising metabolism to reverse fatty liver disease, and supplements that reduce inflammation and oxidative stress in fatty liver disease. To check out the show notes for today's episode, head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash podcast, where you can take a look at the studies and articles and anything else that we reference throughout today's episode. And if you are struggling with any of the symptoms or conditions that we've been describing throughout this series, whether that is fatty liver disease or insulin resistance or other related conditions like diabetes or heart disease, or if you're dealing with other chronic health issues, maybe those are autoimmune conditions or any other sorts of chronic health condition, or various low energy symptoms like chronic cravings and hunger, low energy or fatigue, chronic joint pain, weight gain, digestive symptoms, brain fog, poor sleep, hormonal imbalances, and all of the other symptoms that may come with that, like low libido or issues with fertility, or if you're dealing with any other low energy symptoms, then head over to jfeldmanwellness.com energy, where you can sign up for a free energy balance mini course, where I'll explain how these different symptoms and conditions are really caused by a lack of energy. And I'll also walk you through the main things that you can do from a diet and lifestyle perspective to maximize your cellular energy and resolve these symptoms and conditions. So to sign up for that free energy balance mini course, head over to jfeldmanwellness.com energy. And with that, let's get started. So outside of diet, there are a few other factors that I think are important to focus on for you know resolving these issues that we've discussed re- revolving around fatty liver and, and the pathology that's underlying and I want to focus on supplements today because those are things that I mean there are several that are rather unique to fatty liver that are worth touching on and can have pretty profound effects but I think that we also need to mention first the importance of exercise which the reason I don't want to spend too much time on this is because I think it's rather self-evident and something that's that's talked about uh, in general. We've we've talked about the issues with overexercise, but of course it is important to make sure that somebody is exercising or at least I would say moving enough on a regular basis, not being sedentary. Again, this doesn't mean it has to be anything particularly intense, especially if someone's dealing with you know severe fatty liver or something on that spectrum. That's probably a sign that more than likely they're less fit than they could be. And so I'm not saying, you know, go work toward running a marathon, which, you know, or anything else that's particularly stressful, which can make symptoms worse and drive a lot of stress, drive a lot of the pathology we discussed, but rather just to work on moving on a regular basis, whether that's taking walks daily, maybe going to the gym or picking up some sort of light uh, activity, like swimming or something like that. uh, Those would all be effective. And again, I just want to point out as well that when it comes to exercise and movement, the most notable effects come when you see the difference between being sedentary and being at least lightly active. After that, it's more of a wash. There's, of course, certain thresholds that can vary between people, but the most important thing is just not being sedentary. And that's difficult when we spend so much of our our time just coasting through like our lives working a ton, making sure everything's in order, whatever. So it's easy to become sedentary. And the most important thing is just being on your feet and moving on a semi-regular basis. 
for just general health, but also specifically when it comes to fatty liver in terms of reducing stress, supporting mitochondrial respiration, increasing insulin sensitivity, and increasing metabolic function. I mean, when we're looking at metabolic dysfunction and the diseases that go with it, which fatty liver is one, uh, heart disease, diabetes, uh, and, and insulin resistance, those all see uh, dramatic improvements just from moving out of being sedentary. Yeah. And I would add that I think resistance training specifically, or at least personally, uh, can be very helpful for people with fatty liver by helping all, as long as, you know, it's not done stressfully, right? I'm not saying to go out and squat 400 pounds for 20 rep sets. Uh, even just going in and just if doing a machine circuit, just to apply some resistance on the muscles, as well as maybe going for walks after the meals are helpful to number one, increase insulin sensitivity as, as Jay mentioned, and then also to, in general, just get some lymphatic flow, some blood flow, mm -hmm. get moving, get up. And then I think another point that it can be really helpful for people is having a degree of like a routine or some type of landmark in the day where you have, you know, you have somewhere to go. So if you say, I'm, I'm going to get up at 8am and then I'm going to get into the gym by 10, that'll give you some consistency that'll allow you to you know, have somewhere to be somewhere to go if you if you don't have that currently, because whether you're not feeling well or whatnot, and, you know, have a landmark within the day to set up, you know, having your meals, I'll eat before and then I'll eat, you know, a little bit when I come after and then that sets I think can help to set people up as well. So the walks in the sun. Um, so a resistance training session, maybe three times a week or something like that. Light with machines, nothing too strenuous. Uh, and then perhaps picking up some activities of interest, martial mm -hmm. arts, swimming, so if you like yoga, hiking, kayaking, all these types of things, I think yeah, can be yeah. very helpful um, just for, mul for multiple perspectives. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And again, that'll look different for everyone. So just figuring out what works for you, but at the very least, uh, working to have some, some activity on a regular basis. And yeah. Uh, yeah. And then that before definitely... You, go ahead. I was just going to say before I, you're going to jump into stress before you yeah. do that one thing I want to say to specifically avoid like is running for long distances on a consistent basis over like like 5 miles a day type of thing or whatever to lose weight or running on treadmills for to manage calories and this and that like I think that those are more harmful than they are helpful cuz I just just cuz a lot of I see a lot of people that's their idea is like I want to lose weight so I'm going to go for a run I would uh, generally avoid any of the long distance stuff and like people doing like 35 miles a week. I think that that is actually counterproductive overall. So that I would stay away from any long distance running and any extreme endurance activities. Like if it's swimming, you know, I would say leisurely stuff, go to the beach and go for a swim. Or if you like swimming in, at your local YMCA or whatever, whatever you have available to you, I think those are great, but I wouldn't be doing like ridiculous numbers of laps or anything to lose weight. I think that will start digging more into a stress cascade. Um, yeah. So more like a, a lighter activity overall with the dietary and other lifestyle changes that we'll discuss. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of times people are driving pretty hard into that stress side of things when they're doing the extensive long, long distance running. Of course there are exceptions, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so then on the stress side, so we talked you know, specifically in terms of psychological stress, we did mention this a little bit prior as far as something that can drive all of this underlying pathology, and it definitely can. It increases the stress hormones, and that's when we were talking about it uh, in terms of how how directly the stress hormones drive non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So again, there are this is a whole series on its own. It's something that we've talked about a little bit in the past in terms of other conditions and things where we don't want to ignore the impact that psychological stress has on our health and specifically in the case of fatty liver. So it's worth mentioning there as far as addressing it, it can be a little bit more difficult, you know, than, than anything that we can mention in just a couple minutes. Of course, I think the most important thing here is just working toward doing something on that front. And that can look like meditation or journaling or uh, some sort of activity, you know, whether it's going for a walk or, or yoga or whatever it is that can help to reduce stress considerably having routines um, uh, there's, there's so much that can be dug into there, but it's just worth mentioning that this is a factor that 
directly affects us physiologically and considering that we want to make sure that it is something that we're uh that we're addressing when it comes to metabolic health and and fatty liver yeah i think the biggest thing that i've seen uh with the people that i've worked with is the importance of actually having a routine in the day and having a structure for their day now it doesn't have to be like some of these you know self help gurus wake up at 5:30 do a thousand push ups by 6 and like have every 15 minutes of their schedule absolutely booked off but more of like your the schedule is giving you a loose template to provide structure for your day so that you can prioritize activities for your health mm-hmm. so for example as i mentioned before that's having your meals scheduled into your day having like an hour for your meals where it's like in the morning, I'm going to have breakfast from seven to eight. And I'm going to take that hour to, you know, sit down and eat my meal and be present with my meal. And maybe I'll read a little bit while I'm doing that. Or, and then has saying doing the same thing for lunch, same thing for dinner, like giving yourself that time to eat and, and also giving yourself prep time to pre- prepare the food to, to eat, I think is extremely important. And then also giving yourself downtime. So one of the things personally for me was when I was making a schedule for myself to handle whatever work I was doing, I would never schedule in downtime. And what would wind up happening is I'd be frustrated because I was like not adhering to the schedule hundred percent because the schedule wasn't realistic because it didn't include downtime, which was an absolutely necessary time where I was just like, okay, I'm going to take, you know, this 20, 30 minutes, this hour, maybe I'm going to take a, a, a 20, 30 minute nap and just like unwind a little bit if I'm feeling that like I need to take the nap or, um, if I just wanted to unwind and I didn't want to be researching something or going to the gym or doing an assignment or CEUs for my job, whatever it was like just taking the time to be like, okay, I'm just going to read for right now. And that's, this is what I'm doing. Like this is going to be productive for me and classifying that mentally categorizing that mentally as productive behavior. Cause with that, like without the downtime, you don't have that ability uh, or, or it makes the schedule, uh, difficult to follow it makes it like an untenable plan i think it's something that it's like trying to make like the perfect diet and just making it so hard to follow regardless of how theoretically perfect it is you can't implement it because it's too difficult and it's not perfect so that was that was those are things that i think are really helpful were helpful for me were helpful for some of the things that i've seen with with my clients and then the other thing i want to mention really quick here is that the physiology can put people in a stress state Mm -hmm. where If you're having that dysfunction with the liver and dysfunction in the gut and exposure to endotoxin and energetic fit or not failure, but an energetic imbalance or however you want to term it, you could essentially find that you'll be constantly amped up, unable to relax. You can't sit down and take that time. You can't take that nap. You have a hard time shutting down when you, before you want to go to sleep. So addressing, so by plugging in times to take care of yourself, sitting down and being like, okay. This is how much protein I want to eat in a day. This is my carbs. This is my fats. I'm going to get a little exercise. I'm going to take a nap here. And doing those self-care activities to turn your, your situation around will in turn allow you to relax because you've taken care of yourself instead of just like grasping at, sh- at straws, essentially, where it's like you're just trying to make it all the time. It's like, no, this is my structure. This is what I'm going to follow. Everything else comes after these pieces. I'm going to eat like it's. It's like there's certain necessities it to function to live. Those are eating, sleeping, human interaction, relaxation, and you know if you have to go to the bathroom. And I say that specifically because when I was in the hospital, you didn't have that opportunity a lot of times. Um, but like those things are priority because it's if you want to be good at anything else you do, if you want to succeed or, or or function well in anything else you do, you have to take care of your basic human functions first. So it's kind of like prioritizing those first, which will allow you to relax in other situations. And so you're not chasing the relaxation. By default, you're able to function in relaxation because you have the energy and capabilities and resources to do so. Yeah. Yeah, those are great points. And and it, I just want to mention that it's going to look different for everybody, right? For some people, having an hour for, for every meal may not be uh, doable, it might not be reasonable with their schedule. But that doesn't mean that you want to throw that idea out. It's just making a movement in that direction. Maybe it's literally just having 20 or 30 minutes that you didn't have before when before you just eat at your desk to be more productive, right? And it's just instead taking 20, 30 minutes to sit uh, or 15 minutes, whatever it is, 
but moving in that direction to prioritize, as you mentioned, the self-care and trying to get rid of the idea that the longer that you work, the more productive you are and the fewer breaks you take, the more productive you are. And every minute you spend away from your work means that you're, uh, you're miss- <laughs> this is, you're missing out on opportunity to, to do better in, in that regard or to move forward or progress when, as you mentioned, we are limited in our productive capacities and taking breaks actually helps us recharge in a way that allows us to be more productive, whether it is in work or just being more present with our families or whatever it is that we care about. Uh, we need to prioritize that self-care. And this, again, the reason why I wanted, I was mentioning this in tandem with exercise is because these things can be, you can check both boxes at once, right? If you're taking a 20 minute break and you walk and you don't take your phone with you or you, you know, you're also getting some sunlight and everything that can help both to reduce stress and serve as a real break while also getting some movement in. So yeah, those are all important points. We can definitely spend hours discussing the details there of what someone could do in these different situations. And I'm sure we will at some point. Um, but yeah, let's, let's move on to supplements unless you have anything else to add. No, no, that's perfect. That's, that's about what I had to say. <laughs> perfect. All right. So when it comes to supplements, there are quite a few that have been shown to be protective in fatty liver. And as I've said many times throughout the series, these part of the reason why I think it's so important to go through these things, whether you have fatty liver or not, is because all of these supplements happen to be extremely protective of virtually every health condition that you could imagine and very supportive metabolically and have a ton of great benefits. And again, I'm not saying that every single one of these supplements like that somebody should be on all of them or that using them in any dose is perfectly healthy and and that's uh, the best route to go, but rather that these are all protective substances. They all have their place and, and use depending on the symptoms or conditions that someone is experiencing. And so I think it's really worth hitting on them. And they have, again, really profound effects. It's amazing to see some of the research. Again, we'll talk through some of the specific things as far as fatty liver goes, just to see how much of an impact some of these substances substances can have uh here and again in other conditions as well so uh do you want to start us off with choline okay so we talked about choline and methionine as being extremely important for uh i guess phospholipid incorporation for vldl secretion which is where the liver takes fat puts it into this this lipoprotein particle and then exports it out so we and we also talked that choline can be you can get it largely from eggs, certain seafood like shrimp and liver. But if you say you wanted to take in an extra amount because of a fatty liver situation, there's a couple options you have available. You have a choline by tartrate, probably the last option I would recommend because there's it's it's not as well absorbed as some of the of, of the other ones, and it it can be converted more easily by the microbiome into something called TMAO. I think it's trimethylamine oxidase. Uh, or I for I, trimethylamine, I think I forget what the O specifically means for it, but essentially there's been correlations in rat studies with this compound with, um, heart disease. Now it's the links aren't super strong because there's other foods like fish that actually increase it in large amounts as well. So it's, it's kind of a contentious piece and, you know, it's something where you see in a lot of the plant base where it's like, oh, you don't want to eat. You don't want to eat animal products because of TMAO. And it's kind of like, well, peas also raise TMAO like pretty high in, in certain populations. So, and that's like a, one of the main protein sources for quite a bit of plant-based people because peas have a, the amino acid balance in peas is decent and this has a, a like a decent, decently digestible protein compared to some of the other plant sources. So even the plant sources are producing TMAO in some people, eggs and meat and fish fish was actually one of the highest so any of the the pescatarians or whatever avoiding meat and eggs because tmao was well fish was one of the better sources but regardless regardless of all of that choline by tartrate has been shown to raise tmao um l-carnitine is something that does it well it's not necessarily something we're recommending here but the basically the bacteria in the intestine will take these components and they will convert them into this compound tmao now the other options for choline supplementation instead of choline by tartrate is going to be uh, phosphatidylcholine or phosphatidylcholine and uh, uh, what is it? Uh, Alpha GPC, which is uh, it's 
not as targeted towards the liver like a phosphatidylcholine because the phosphatidylcholine will go into the actual um the the phospholipid head of the vldl the al the alpha gpc gets pushed more towards uh like neurotransmitter with acetylcholine as far as for muscle contraction or for what's going on in the brain that's kind of how they break them down and i think alpha gpc can be a little bit more expensive sometimes if, if i remember correctly but phosphatidylcholine would probably be the best option as far as fatty liver goes and again you can get a decent amount of choline from eggs liver and seafood itself so if you're going to do the choline supplement on top i would do a phosphatidylcholine or maybe an alpha gpc the other thing to keep in mind that you can combine with your choline supplement is also you could take something like a betaine hcl the reason is because the betaine, if you remember the choline pathway we went through, you can have choline come into the pathway or you can have um, the, like methionine with the pathway. Um, involved in this is, is to some extent is betaine and betaine, I won't go through all of the mechanisms, but it essentially, it spares choline from having to be shunted towards the betaine pathway. So if you take a betaine HCL, it is sparing the choline that you are that you are taking in. So combining them together can have what like a synergistic effect. Now you can get betaine in food like spinach or beets, um, but it's kind of hard to. I, I mean, I I wouldn't make it. I wouldn't like go out of your way to eat large amounts of spinach or beets to get betaine. Is kind of my perspective. So the other thing is the betaine HCL actually comes with hydrochloric acid. That's the HCL part. It's often used to raise stomach acid with people who have fatty liver. They also tend to have issues within the small intestine taking such as small intestine bacterial overgrowth, taking a betaine HCL can help to raise stomach acid as well and help with some of that small intestine bacterial overgrowth if it's present and help to improve digestion, which can be impaired with fatty liver. So it can have a dual function. Uh, they can have a dual function, synergizes with the phosphatidylcholine. I would stay away from choline by tartrate and alpha GPC can be an option, but it generally is taken more for like a neurotransmitter effect. Yeah. Yeah. And so just to, to put this in context, so the choline is necessary and helpful for the export of fats from the liver, which is that one side of the equation that we talked about. Um, the really secondary side that can be impaired, especially if somebody has choline deficiency or methionine deficiency or both. And in the case that someone has a choline deficiency, supplementing with choline can be particularly helpful. In the case that somebody has other issues with the methionine pathways, uh, that could potentially also be a reason to supplement with choline um, or the betaine. And or both, yeah. Right, right. And that's like the MTHFR uh, mutations that people will touch on a lot. I, just to mention real quick, you know, the distribution of, of quote unquote mutation there is pretty, um, pretty evenly spread out throughout the population. So it, it's not like people who have certain, uh, certain reduced capacities in their MTHFR um, activity are these outliers who have this very rare issue i mean most people are able to be perfectly healthy regardless of where they are on that spectrum depending on where you are on the spectrum you may have some you may benefit more from somebody else more than somebody else with some of these supplements you might have more of a need for these things but in yeah. general it's it's the reason i'm saying this is because it, it's such a focus and most people don't even aren't even aware of the different types of mutations and that um, some might only impair the enzyme activity by, you know, 15%, for example, as opposed to 80% on the other end. So with that in mind, there are certain places where these things might be particularly beneficial. However, it's also worth pointing out, as we mentioned earlier, it's really easy to get enough methionine from the diet. And choline is relatively easy to get from the diet as well. And unless somebody's choline deficient, I probably wouldn't be looking quite as much to the supplement. Again, if somebody has fatty liver, they could probably use some help there. But this is not something that's really addressing the underlying issues as much as it is just supporting the export of fat, which is important as well. And again, especially if someone's deficient, it would be something to look to. But it, beyond that, I wouldn't be uh, 
it's not at the top of my list. No, I mean, if if you can eat adequate liver on a regular basis and eggs, I would say, you know, you're doing pretty well overall. For example, I'll eat two to three eggs every day um, and in liver biweekly, once a month type of deal. And the the other thing is, as far as MTHFR stuff goes, it's you also that also plays in with B vitamins, which I, I guess we'll talk to we'll talk about next. But there's a whole bunch of like there's multiple factors going on within all of those pathways that include obviously 5-methylfolate, um, methylcobalamin, which is B12, uh, folate B9, uh, and then choline, and then betaine, and then you have other things like creatine or whatnot. There's a whole host of things that can be used to help that situation supplementally that can make uh, quite a big difference for people. So if you do have something like that, those are things to look into, but I would try to like also at the same time, reach a lot of this stuff from a dietary perspective first and have the supplements as additions to literally as supplements to the diet. So those are, it can cause problems. There can be a big difference from the supplements. The, I think these can all help in fatty liver. I think a lot of these supplements can help in MTHFR mutations, which is, that's an entirely different podcast story that we'll have to do at one point. But um, yeah, overall, I, I I think that they can be helpful. Yeah. And so just, uh, we'll just touch on those couple of B vitamins. You already mentioned them, the the B12 and B9, which is folate. Both of those are involved in the methionine cycling uh, pathways. And we had discussed these a little bit uh, prior when we were talking about liver, uh, the liver's export of fat. Mm -hmm. And yes, if you have deficiencies there, they could be helpful to supplement. As far as B12 goes, similar to methionine, it's very easy to get enough B12 if you're eating animal sources of protein. And so I pretty much never suggest that somebody supplements with that unless they aren't eating animal protein sources, which is, uh, you know, I think generally less than ideal in and of itself. Yeah. So I'd re- recommend doing that prior to supplementing with B12. But if somebody's not going to do those things, then yeah, I think you might want to supplement with some B12. Uh, and then as far as folate goes, Again, we should be able to get enough folate from our diets in the case, again, that somebody has an MTHFR mutation that where the uh, activity of the enzyme is pretty heavily decreased, then yes, maybe supplementing with the methyl tetrahydrofolate form would be helpful in that context. But again, I think the vast majority of people don't really have any issues there. Uh, again, even if they have one of the mutations and we would have to go through all the different alleles and everything, but uh, you would, you know, if you look it up, you can find out the uh, the how much the enzyme activity is reduced based on your particular uh, mutation, and it might not be such a concern. But again, I, I think there's when it comes to supplementing with the folate, there's nothing wrong with supplementing with it and seeing if it makes a difference. But again, I would say that these are things that are generally helpful only if there is some sort of a deficiency or issue in the pathway, uh, as opposed to really a broad spectrum. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to just add in here, if you are having any like significant digestive issues, um, for example, I had a few people I worked with who had bariatric surgeries, uh, using B12 in those instances would actually probably be something that's helpful. Right, right. So that's very, but if you're eating steak or seafood or liver or eggs or any of these animal protein sources on a regular basis, B12, like you should be able to do just fine with it, assuming that your stomach acid, pepsin, intrinsic factor production are all fine. Yeah. Basically, as long as you're able to absorb the nutrient is what you're getting at. Yeah. It shouldn't be a problem getting enough B12, that is. Yeah. And there, I think, uh, so I guess moving on a little bit, there are other B vitamins besides B9 and B12 that can be very helpful. I don't know if you want to that, and they all, these function not in methylation, but in energy metabolism. Sure. Go for it. That's going to be your, uh, your thiamine, your niacinamide, your riboflavin, your pyridoxine and, um, your biotin. And I guess your vitamin B, B5, your pantothenic acid, all of these function in the utilization of substrate carbohydrates and fats. And then I guess protein to some extent, which will be converted into carbohydrate as a source of fuel they require throughout that entire process making sure that you have adequate amounts of all these is vital for cellular respiration for energy production at the cell so any type of deficiency of that which is actually very possible if you're coming from a 
poor, a nutrient poor, heavily refined diet with a uh, pathology on top of that, it's, I think it'd be pretty helpful to fill in those, those gaps with, with the B vitamins in general. Yeah. Yeah. These are, we've, we've, I think we talk about them quite a bit because they're so integral to the energy production, uh, pathways and it's very easy to become deficient in them. And even if someone's not particularly deficient, adding them in tends to be very supportive. And again, you see that in terms of fatty liver, uh, you see it pretty clearly with vitamin B3, where it's able to reverse liver pathology in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It's able to prevent the progression of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and cirrhosis, and again, reverse the damage that's seen there. So, and a lot of the ways that it's doing that is by supporting respiration, res, you know, reducing the NADH to NAD ratio or increasing the NAD to NADH ratio, uh, increasing ATP production, reducing oxidative stress, reducing inflammation. Uh, and then again, the same thing with B1 where you see that, and we'll talk about this later on, uh, where there are a few studies looking at a combination of testosterone and B1 being able to reverse liver cirrhosis, which as we've mentioned is the, the most severe form well, one of the most severe forms of, of fatty liver, maybe outside of cancer. And uh, yeah, and so so these are, again, uh, vitamins that can have profound effects and are, in this case, are doing so by directly supporting our ability to produce energy, which we've talked quite a bit about why that is the key to, uh, I mean, fixing that is the key to resolving fatty liver issues. Yeah, and as using them, I would just say that I would use most of these vitamins or a lot of these most of the vitamins and mineral supplements I would use in smaller doses more frequently. So like have a little bit with each meal instead of taking massive doses all at once, you'll have a better absorption and it's a little bit more physiologic, you know, to have a smaller dose more consistently mixed in with the meal. Um, and I think you'll have a better chance absorbing and utilizing the vitamins instead of just you know, either passing it through your stool or, or, or urinating a lot of it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Anything else to add in about the B vitamins? No, they're very general. I think I think they're like pretty helpful in almost every situation. That's mm -hmm. especially just because they're used for energy production, which is so core to everything that we talk about. So, yeah, yeah. All right. So there are a few other amino acids, uh, or a few amino acids that I think are worth touching on that all have been shown to have some pretty protective effects in terms of fatty liver. One of them is taurine, which has some yeah some some very protective effects in the liver. It's able to prevent the oxidative stress that goes on in fatty liver disease and prevent the development of fatty liver, reducing inflammation specifically in the liver, um, inhibiting the inflammation response to endotoxin, uh, preventing fat production in the liver, uh, preventing various issues that go on with the ability to export the fat in fatty liver. So taurine is an amino acid that we can get in our diet, but it can be difficult to get it in substantial amounts that would probably be, you know, that would be helpful in a situation of resolving fatty liver. So uh, that's one that I think is worth considering uh, supplementing with and yeah, has, has some really protective effects there. Yeah. I think that it also, something that's helpful with taurine is that it helps with bile acid conjugation. The bile acids can help clear out dysbiosis in the small intestine. They can help enhance digestion and absorption. Um, and then taurine overall just has like a generally antioxidant, anti-inflammatory effect throughout the body. Um, the Something that's to keep in mind with that is in some people, it can drastically increase bile acid production. So you can like, it can be a little bit uncomfortable when you start using. So just something to, to keep an eye out for. And um yeah, again, I would split up dosing with taurine and not take mm -hmm. massive doses like like five grams in a sitting. Like I would take smaller doses throughout the day with meals. That's something I would always recommend is take it take it with meals. For me, I I drop a lot of the stuff if I'm going to use it into like my smoothie. So I'll have pineapple juice, some guava, and then I'll put in because the taurine is mostly tasteless. Um, the B vitamins are in the amounts that I use them are mostly tasteless. So I'll drop all that in. And just blend it up, cal um, magnesium, whatever it is, and and take smaller doses on a more frequent basis. Yeah, so it, I'm I'm glad you mentioned that. A lot of times when people are struggling uh, with liver issues, they 
You might have some issues with bile secretion or uh, congestion. Bile congestion and the taurine can increase the release of bile. And if you are having those issues and you take a decent amount of taurine, as you mentioned, it can cause some pain, some discomfort. It can also cause loose stools. So yeah, I'd start with a very low dose. Make sure you're having it with food, specifically a meal with some fat in it. And yeah, small dose, maybe 200 milligrams, 250 milligrams, something like that to start. Make sure you do all right with it. And I've seen that happen where somebody reacts a little bit strongly initially, maybe to the first or second dose, and then they're totally fine afterward. And they can go up to, you know, a couple grams several times a day and, and be totally fine with that. So yeah, I'd start with a small dose. Make sure to have it with a meal that has fat so that if you are releasing bile, it's not just going right through it. It'll kind of be slowed down by the, the fat that you're taking in. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's the best way to go about it with taurine. And I've seen the same thing where it's like the first couple doses, especially when somebody wants to take like a large dose right away. Cause they read like the beneficial studies on it. And it's like, Oh, I'm going to do 12 grams today. <laughs> so they like do the 12 gram dose and they start getting bile issues from it in terms of like their liver starts ramping up bile production. Um, so, and then you lower the dose a little bit and then it can, it'll actually eventually dissipate. So I've definitely seen that as well. The other thing I want to mention with taurine is it has some GABAergic effects. Mm -hmm. So some mm -hmm. slightly calming effects. So when I tend to use it with people, I tend to have them take it at night because if you take a whole bunch of taurine in the morning and the other amino acid we're going to touch on next is glycine. In some people, you can like, it will just chill you out. So you'll be getting ready to go. You'll have your morning smoothie. You get to work and you're just like sitting at your desk or whatever, wherever you work, you're just so relaxed and you don't want to do anything. Those are some of the side effects that you can get from some of these GABAergic compounds, taurine, glycine, magnesium, um, vitamin C. Those all have modulatory effects on GABA and then glycine is also an actual inhibitory neurotransmitter itself. So uh, yeah, I don't have anything else to add from there if you want to jump into glycine. So yeah, so I just wanted to say, of course, that is individual. I've had a lot of people who take it morning, you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner and are fine. Uh, sometimes, yeah, concentrating it with a higher dose in the evening or lunch and dinner is, is fine as well. So yeah. And, and the other thing too, as far as needing to start with that small dose, I would say most people are totally fine even starting with, you know, a couple of grams of, yeah. of taurine, but just wanted to put a word of caution out just, especially if someone's dealing with, with some significant fatty liver issues, that would be a, a cause for me to want to start with a very small dose. And then along with that as well, you kind of, I think, alluded to this, but it's also worth mentioning Tudka here, which is basically a taurine conjugated bile acid. And Tudka specifically has been shown to be very protective uh, with, with these non-alcoholic fatty liver disease issues. And it's been shown to prevent or reduce the ER stress, that, the stress in the endoplasmic reticulum that we discussed previously mm -hmm. that leads to the problems with essentially uh, the export of fat from the liver. So it's able to pre prevent that. It's able to support the the gut health side of things, as you mentioned, that taurine's able to as well. So that would be another one along with taurine that would be worth considering uh, the yeah. use of as a supplement. Well, and Tudka is actually a bile acid itself. So right, right. for people, if you're going to use Tudka, I would 100% recommend that you take it with a fatty meal. Mm -hmm. um, and also be careful, more careful with your dosing with Tudka because it can actually cause bile acid diarrhea. Uh, especially if you don't have a gallbladder, which is, for example, someone like me. Um, it's, but it it does have a. There's bodybuilders specifically use Tudka because of its liver protective effects. Um, it helps to deep. So for the ER stress, it decreases ER stress by inhibiting or protecting against that unfolded protein response that we talked about in some of the pathology. Uh, it inhibits nitro tyrosylization, which is where like a nitric group is added to a tyrosine on the protein. That's usually in like a, in a stressful state. And like, it, it's not good for the protein structure of the liver. It improves bile flow. It actually protects the liver from having the excess like bile acids in, in the liver and like ligation studies, because the uh, ligation meaning where they burn the bile ducts and animals so that there's no bile can't be released. And then the bile acids in the liver actually damage the liver, but the Tudka is protective because it's water soluble. Um, so it helps to protect against like the detergent effects of the bile acids. It actually was shown to increase liver regeneration in some models and it can protect like from colitis and a whole bunch of issues. So Tudka is definitely um, one of the great 
a great option for people if but after these other fundamental options haven't worked because Tudka is a little bit more potent. And then also one of the things I want to talk about is it can improve intestinal integrity and improve microbiome situations. I've had situations where people have come from being super low fat for an extended period of time and then developed gallbladder issues and Tudka helps significantly to relieve those issues. Um, and then I've also seen quite a few anecdotes for people where they had elevated liver enzymes, ALT, AST. Uh, these are specifically bodybuilders and they took a course of Tudka and it dropped the liver enzymes for them. And they were using like heavy duty steroids that are not good for your liver, like oral steroids, which are pretty terrible for your liver overall. And it was able to reverse some of that damage, at least based on the lab results. So Tudka overall can be a good option, but again, it's way, it's like a super potent option. And, um, I would try the other stuff first, uh, just because like the bile acid diarrhea situation is really uncomfortable. <laughs> um, it's like, very, it's actually painful. It's like you literally are, are going to the bathroom and it's like acidic. So just that's one to be, be careful with, but it can also be really helpful in certain situations. So just some, something to consider. Yeah. Yeah. And as you mentioned, being careful with the dosing is a good way to minimize those side effects. Yeah. And taking it with a, taking it with a fatty meal for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And, uh, so moving on to glycine, which is an extremely protective amino acid. We've talked about this, uh, in comparison with methionine and, and the quote inflammatory amino acids, methionine, cysteine and tryptophan in how glycine is very protective in terms of longevity, where you see the benefits of restricting things like methionine and cysteine. Uh, in terms of longevity, and if you don't restrict them and just give glycine, it uh, is able to have the same effects. And you actually see a parallel situation in fatty liver, where we know that feeding a, a methionine and choline deficient diet will impair the liver's excretion of fat and cause fatty liver, but just supplementing with glycine is able to oppose and reverse or prevent that from happening, both by it has some roles in the methionine cycling pathways, so that is one factor, but it also is pretty directly anti-inflammatory, prevents all of the oxidative stress that's seen when the liver is, is in that pathologic state, so it's pretty protective on that front, and then also is very protective of the gut and maintaining the intestinal barrier and keeping inflammation down in that regard, and so uh, that would be one to consider as well, which... I think we had discussed how uh, important it would be to get glycine from the diet as far as uh, gelatinous meats, bone broths, and things like that. But if those things are not feasible, then a collagen supplement or just a direct glycine supplement if either somebody doesn't respond well to a, a collagen or gelatin supplement or if they aren't able to get the gelatinous meats, all of those things. But glycine itself is extremely protective regardless of where you're getting it from. Yep. And I would say glycine also is involved in the conjugation of bile acids. So again, if you, if you taking taurine and you also take glycine and you've come from a super low fat diet, or you have something going on with the liver, you can get that. Like it's, it's, they don't call it bile dumping, but that's kind of the way I describe it, where you start getting this production of bile acids and this, this outflow of bile acids. And if your intestine isn't used to it, it's the combination of both can cause that that uh, bile acid diarrhea effects. So there's something to keep in mind with that. Um, I'd like to use glycine um, again in smaller doses and combinations with other proteins. So like if you have a collagen hydrolysate, what I often have people do is they'll add some into that juice or that smoothie. And if they eat, if they have that with their eggs, then you have a balance of the glycine and the methionine from the eggs. And then you also have all the benefits of the eggs and the BCAA um, amino acids that are coming from the eggs as well plus the choline from the eggs, whatever it is, or if you're doing steak or seafood, same type of deal. So I like to do smaller doses, um, in more kit, like oh, with, with multiple meals. The other mm -hmm. thing I want to mention here, and this is something that I saw on the forum recently, people talking about using gelatin or collagen or, or th these types of meats, these types of proteins as a main source of protein gelatin or collagen hydrolysate or any of these are not main sources of protein. They are deficient in these, these amino acids like, uh, what is it, cysteine and tryptophan, and then they lack or they are much lower in your BCAAs and your methionine. 
So just something to keep in mind, gelatin or collagen shouldn't be a main source of protein. At least in my perspective, it should always be a supplemental addition to the diet. Um, and then also if you're using the supplemental gelatins or collagens, they are very nutrient poor. Um, so that's something, something to keep in mind. And I want the last piece I want to add with supplemental collagen gelatin, or even bone broth or some of the like coll collagenous meats for some people, those foods are cause digestive issues, skin issues, and mental issues. I think because the actual components of the bone broth collagen gelatin aren't digested well. And then the microbiome gets a hold of them and can cause histaminergic reactions and all types of weird reactions. In those cases, using a pure glycine would actually be better, um, even though the collagen I, in theory is better. So that's kind of where like, you have to see what your tolerance is and adjust from there. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And when it comes to trying to determine what portion of your protein intake should be from collagen or gelatin, again, I come back to focusing on gelatinous cuts of meat, which would have some amount of, of gelatin and collagen in there, as well as the, the meat from the muscle itself, which has the, or the amino acids from the muscle, which have the, the methionine and BCAAs and everything else, which we want in moderate amounts. You get them in milk as well. I mean, these, these amino acids are all necessary for maintaining our own uh, tissues, you know, our own muscles and bones and everything, skin, all of that. So yep. we want to make sure we're getting all of those amino acids and just balancing them with the, the gelatin and collagen. Uh, and again, as you mentioned, I think it's preferable to be getting those things from the meat directly as opposed to from the supplement. And it, I think it's just a matter of, of adapting or just slowly shifting the types of foods. I mean, it is relatively arbitrary, you could say, that we've determined that things like chicken breast and steak are the normal quote unquote foods as opposed to, you know, beef shanks or truck roasts or, you know, what like uh, ribs or something. And the muscle based meats without the gelatin aren't going to have the collagen and gelatin. And yes, you can have those and then just add in the protein powders, but I just think it's easier and more cost effective. And generally more nutritious to just shift over toward some of those other um, meat sources. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it just depends on what what people's contexts are for those. I, I go on a case by case basis. Some people want to yeah, make roasts and stuff like that. And, and some people still want to eat their chicken breast and whatever else. And it's like, okay, we'll just, you know, just balance it. Whatever works for your individual context as far as introduce you know, you want to do collagenous cuts and roasts and stuff like that. That's awesome. Or if you, you know, some, if you don't want to do those for cooking or for whatever it is, then, um, you know, find, find an option that works to do There's kind of a spectrum there. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, it's, I'm not saying never to eat those other things. And again, if you're eating chicken and it's from a pastured source and you have the chicken breast with the bone in it and the skin, then you'd probably be able to get a decent amount of, of gelatin or collagen from that. Uh, but that's just not what most people are doing. And, and again, this is not a never eat chicken breast or steak or that anytime you eat them, you need to have your spoonful of collagen with it right away. We're just talking about general, uh, general shifts dietarily okay. that I think are, are beneficial. Yeah. One of the things I want to talk about really quick before we move on, to some of the antioxidant compounds, the like more specific ones are um, like th the essential amino acid idea. Just briefly, these amino acids, and I just want to give an example. Uh, cysteine, for example, is required for glutathione production, which is essential in maintaining oxidative stress or like balancing oxidative stress inside the cell. Leucine, the branch chain amino acids, which is your leucine, isoleucine, valine, are extremely important for maintaining your lean mass and, and muscle protein synthesis and a host of these other components. Tryptophan is involved in neurotransmitter production and is also involved and obviously can go to serotonin, but also involved in producing vitamin B3 in the form of niacin. And then a whole, a bunch of these other amino acids like methionine are involved in methylation and different cycling within the body there. So I know there's this idea, at least within some of the peat sphere where it's like these amino acids are bad. It's, I want to 
kind of like shift away from the idea that they are necessarily bad. It's they have a function, but there can be a cost with some of that function because I've seen I've seen it quite a bit recently where it's like, oh, I'm gonna eliminate these these amino acids from my diet and make make you know try and limit them as much as possible. Um, and I think that there can be issues associated with doing that. And I just want to, I want to point that out and just to give a few examples of where some of these things are extremely important. Um, and again, I think balancing with glycine to deal with some of the methionine is an excellent option. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And while we're touching on the amino acids, there's another one I wanted to mention, which was uh, theanine. Which theanine is generally known for being found in teas, uh, specifically green tea, and I think some in black tea as well. And it's been shown to protect against liver injury from uh, directly caused by endotoxin and mm -hmm. inflammation caused by endotoxin. And so that would be another one that, similarly to things like glycine and taurine, is able to increase GABA considerably. So it's often used for relaxation and for uh, helping with sleep or decreasing anxiety, but it also has protective effects in the liver. Uh, in the situation so it's not necessarily something i'd be using in in large doses regularly but it's again one of those generally protective ones that especially if you're also looking for the relax relaxation type effects i think it would be a good one to look to yep yeah of course and then obviously there are benefits to some of the teas on the liver as well um the only problem with the green teas or that 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 family of teas green tea white tea black tea is they can accumulate fluoride and i think also aluminum so you just have to be careful with the source but there is a whole bunch of studies from the polyphenols from those tea which we talked about polyphenols related to diet which are the protective plant compounds having a beneficial effect on fatty liver but some other herbal teas you know from their poly polyphenolic content may be helpful so maybe something like a chamomile to look into and again all these go hand in hand with managing that stress as well if they can easily, if like a combination glycine, taurine, theanine, magnesium, and then chamomile with like a juice or something is that probably could be a pretty, for some people, depending on your, your response to it, it could be pretty powerful in, in having a relaxation effect. Um, so just, just something to keep in mind. And I don't know if you want to add anything to the cocktail there or anything. No, no. So I guess we'll jump in before we get into some of the other like a less, like, I guess more pharmaceutical or hormone based stuff, or is the, uh, the antioxidant compounds, which are, or vitamin E and vitamin C, the main ones we talked about polyphenols already. Uh, just when we talked about the, the pathology of fatty liver, one of the biggest portions of that was elevated oxidative, oxidative stress and reactive oxygen species production, vitamin C and vitamin E work together and work together to handle reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress. They all also work with glutathione, which is produced from the amino acids I just mentioned. So making sure that you're having adequate amino acid intake for glutathione production, which is, again, is actually dependent upon having adequate carbohydrates as well through NADPH and the pentose uh, phosphate pathway. That's a different story. We'll get into that another time, but having the adequate glucose having adequate amino acids, specifically cysteine, glycine, and glutamate, and then having adequate vitamin C and vitamin E are all important for protecting against reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress. Vitamin E is more specific towards your, your, your fatty, it's a fatty acid oxidant, or it's more, it's fat soluble, whereas vitamin C is more water soluble. They do work together. Mm -hmm. um, so they're both like very important from that antioxidant perspective, which was a huge role in fatty liver and there are studies showing benefits in using them yeah yeah when we were talking about the devastating impacts of PUFA in the progression of fatty liver disease we talked about a study where i think they'd given omega-3s and omega-6s and then either gave them uh vitamin e as an antioxidant or something to chelate iron which we'll talk about in a bit and both of those things pre uh, prevented the damaging effects from the PUFA so we see that a lot, you know, generally in the bioenergetic pro-metabolic community. Vitamin E is talked about as something that can oppose the effects of PUFA. And so you see it in those sorts of situations and you see it in, in the case of fatty liver. You see vitamin E to be extremely protective, preventing the progression through fatty liver 
uh, lowering liver enzymes, preventing fat accumulation, all of those things. So yeah, I think it's a great one to consider as far as the supplement goes. And same with vitamin C, of course, vitamin C is a little easier to get from the diet, assuming that you're eating a considerable, a considerable amount of fruit and even roots and tubers, potentially even meat as well. There's um, some dehydro. Yeah, that there's dehydroasorbate. That yeah, that there's a fat soluble vitamin C in there. Uh, so yeah, I mean it's one that's generally easier to get in the diet. But again, nothing wrong with uh, adding in some some food based vitamin C as well. Yeah, and I just want to mention uh, some specific besides the antioxidant effect of vitamin C, you also have the immune boosting effect, which may help with some of the endotoxin situations that you have with fatty liver. And you mm -hmm. also have vitamin C is involved in bile acid production directly. And it's also involved in the function of the enzyme carnitial palmitoyl oil transferase one, which helps transports fats into the mitochondria. So there's, there's a bunch of functions off targeted vitamin C besides being antioxidant. So having adequate amounts can be very helpful. Um, yeah, overall. So yeah. I, I would vitamin C and vitamin E are great options. Fruit specifically has the carbohydrate and the vitamin C and the minerals and the polyphenols. So overall, if you want to talk about superfoods, which are like all the rage now, you know, <laughs> your regular pineapple juice, orange juice, grape juice, pomegranate juice, having guava or whatever, whatever fruits you're tolerating well that aren't causing digestive issues are, can be very helpful uh, for the fatty liver situation in general. And there's a ton of studies showing, you know, just extract of this fruit given to rats that are given the Western diet, which is usually corn oil, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. actually is protective against some of the effects. So this fruit as a supplement itself is, and even the potatoes or like sweet potatoes or, or, or yams or white potatoes even show benefit in some of these situations, despite having, you know, white potatoes are evil because they're glycemic index or whatever the idea because they're the that. color white man <laughs> that's why <laughs> yeah you shouldn't eat white foods <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah um yeah no white potatoes are, are pretty nutritious uh despite their color <laughs> yeah and the glycemic index or whatever yeah. yeah yeah uh yeah those are all great points uh and while we're talking about things that block the inflammation and the progression of fatty liver aspirin is another one that's worth mentioning at uh, as one that's effective at blocking the effects of PUFA and blocking the inflammation cascades. We talked about studies that when they did block PUFA metabolites by blocking the LOX enzyme in particular in that one study, they were able to prevent fat accumulation as a result of high uh, fructose intake in rats and rats you know, that had endotoxin issues and all of that. So considering that aspirin is helpful in that regard, uh, it would be worth considering and it has been shown to prevent the progression of fatty liver and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease uh, into the deeper levels of, of fibrosis and cirrhosis and everything. So aspirin would be another one to consider. And again, keeping in mind, some people might consider it a pharmaceutical when, which is again, semantic, but uh, if you want to take the white willow bark version, which is where it basically came from, uh, that would be an, an option if that makes you feel like you're having more of a food instead of a chemical, <laughs> yeah, a natural compound. Yeah. One thing I want to just mention with aspirin for people is there's a wrap for aspirin causing irritation to the intestine or the stomach. Easy way to mitigate that is to take it with vitamin C, which has been shown in studies to be protective against that damage. And then also taking it with glycine has been shown to be helpful for the symptoms as well. So like a gly mixing glycine with some vitamin C again, vitamin C can actually be like a high quality sorbic acid, or you can take it. My preference is to take it in the form of something like a camu camu, um, which is high in vitamin C and also has a whole bunch of those, those beneficial plant compounds that can modulate the microbiome and protect the liver from oxidative stress or like a acerola cherry, or you can take it with like, and some orange juice or something like that can be helpful to mitigate some of the, the, the irritating effects for some people of the aspirin. And I just want to point out with aspirin, we always have to say this, but just, you know, always discuss with your doctor and yada, yada, yada. And we're not giving medical advice and all that, all that type of stuff. Yeah. With all these, all these, yeah, things, yeah. with everything. Yeah. 
Yeah. So another another thing that I had mentioned earlier was the chelation of iron being able to prevent liver damage and progression through fatty liver disease. And one compound that might be uh, worth considering for doing that would be lactoferrin, which also has the ability to decrease inflammation as well as a lot of anti-inflammatory type effects and some antimicrobial effects as well. And it's been shown to prevent the liver injury and damage that goes on in response to alcohol. It's been shown to prevent um, metabolic dysfunction and, and fatty liver progression and increase insulin sensitivity and, and prevent fatty liver from developing by removing iron and reducing the oxidative stress that is a, you know, that the excess iron would cause. So that might be another supplement to consider from that regard. Yeah, that's definitely, I think, it's definitely a possible one to use. I think a lot of people, there's in these states, in some of these inflammatory states, you kind of get into this sticky situation where you have a lot of iron bound up in ferritin, which is the storage form. And I don't know if I, I think I may have touched on this earlier, but in, in this, this series, it's been so long, I don't remember exactly everything we've covered, but the, the ferritin will, the body will increase iron's uh, I guess, mobilization into ferritin under states of inflammation or chronic type, any type of chronic infection state, mm -hmm. because the bacteria will try to sequester the iron. And then the iron is also, um, is very likely to oxidize in these inflammatory states. So ferritin essentially protects the body from the effects of that iron. And iron is absolutely essential for quite a few functions in the body, but in excess of the iron, can be very problematic. So any, if you do have like in some of these states looking at a liver panel, and then for some people actually looking to see if you have, which is relatively rare, uh, hemochromatosis, which is an iron a genetic disorder where you store excess iron that could also directly be leading to fatty liver and liver impairment, diabetes through oxidative stress. So that's something to consider as well. And if you do have an excess of iron in the system, or you're actually anemic, but your ferritin levels are high. Um, if you have the excess iron, getting rid of it, black ferritin could help, but also maybe some, um, some phlebotomy, like mm -hmm. uh, blood donations can help. Mm -hmm. uh, if you, but if you have a high ferritin and you're actually anemic, blood donation doesn't necessarily solve that. What solves that is redistribution of the iron by lowering whatever the inflammatory or infective stimulus is. So if you have the chronic endotoxemia coming from the gut, you would have to adjust that rather than do venipuncture or, or phlebotomy. If you did phlebotomy, you would actually make the situation worse because your, your active iron would, would possibly be low um, with a lot of it bound up in ferritin. And with that said, that brings me to something to address as well is the adjusting or manipulating the microbiome in fatty liver with, with an antimicrobial as well as with a change in diet. The antimicrobial could be like an herbal one, like an oregano oil or um, a, a cinnamon oil or any, 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 some of these herbal compounds could be helpful to manipulate the microbiome, possibly wipe out any pathogens and with the change of diet, be able to sustain it. And some of the studies, they actually were able to do this directly. Um, I think one of the studies we talked about they were actually able to change the people, people who had obesity and fatty liver, changed their diet. They lost the weight and the liver fat went as well. So, and that was through manipulations in the microbiomes for these individuals, as well as obviously decreasing oxidative stress. They weren't, we don't know which was the chicken or the egg, but the whole situation was able to adjust by the dietary change. Um, and helping that along could be modulating the microbiome with and some type of herbal antimicrobial. That's a possible option, especially if SIBO is present. Yeah. Yeah. Or potentially a pharmaceutical one as well, depending on the situation, uh, potentially in a lower dose. Again, all of that is, there's a lot of factors that can go into navigating that situation. We've talked about it in a few previous episodes, so I'll link to those because there's, yeah, it's, it's a, there's a lot there as far as yeah. the different antibiotic, antifungal, uh, antiparasitic compounds that can be used whether they're herbal or, fan or pharmaceutical, but if there is a microbial issue that is not being improved by restoring effective digestion and restoring uh, metabolic function to the extent that it can be and eating digestible foods, if 
it still seems to be an issue that is a limiting factor, a bottleneck, then it, it's generally worth uh, working to uh, resolve it with some sort of an antimicrobial. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And again, I would, you know, under the supervision of a trained medical professional and all, and your doctor, whoever it is. Yes. <laughs> But in talking about both polyphenols and general antimicrobials, things that are anti-inflammatory and things that reduce iron absorption or, or the amount of iron that we take in, uh, caffeine and coffee come to mind as well, as, and also specifically with, fat, with fatty liver. Uh, and we did an episode, or I think it was part of a Q&A, where we discussed coffee and caffeine. So I'll link back to that. But caffeine and coffee are incredibly protective of liver health. They protect against the effects of endotoxin, they reduce inflammation, they have antimicrobial effects, uh, they're able to lower liver enzymes and reduce liver pathology, prevent uh, fibrosis, prevent cirrhosis, and they also you know, prevent mortality from these things, or reduce mortality from these things, not prevent. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the important thing here as well is that beyond being generally anti-inflammatory and protective of the gut, uh, coffee is also coffee or the compounds in it, including caffeine, are also effective at stimulating and supporting respiration, uh, meaning the amount of energy pr we're producing. So something that is helping on that fundamental level to then resolve all of these issues. And I think that's a major reason why you see such a wide array of benefits from it. And interestingly as well, the liver's ability to, to metabolize the caffeine can also be a measure of its function, which can also mean that some people who are dealing with liver pathology might not be able to 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 tolerate caffeine effectively because because they aren't clearing it well potentially or they're not able to handle the stimulation because there there are too many blockages along the the pathway if that is something that someone's experiencing then i would not suggest taking in a lot of coffee or caffeine or any necessarily uh you want to make sure that you're able to handle that stimulus well without and uh without driving any stress so or driving minimal amounts of stress or really opposing stress so that's something to, to keep in mind there as well yeah coffee is definitely one i think that's based on on individual tolerance in these in these situations uh, i've seen it help people i've seen some people love it and do well in it but i've also seen some people not do so not do so hot with with coffee or caffeine and that's really going to be one of those things, again, where you got to just experiment and see how you feel. Uh, one thing I would say is if you're going to do coffee, uh, a lot of people like to wake up and have it black. I would not recommend that. I recommend if you're going to do coffee, take it with a meal. Mm -hmm. Have it with breakfast. Do some eggs, some, some fruit juice, some, some fruit, a smoothie, whatever it is. Have, have some coffee with that. Um, I think that's probably one of the better ways to go. Yeah. Yeah. And there are a few other nuances there. I'll just refer back to that previous episode because I think we discussed all of that and how, yes, a lot, the way that a lot of people are using coffee is not supportive metabolically or of liver health for that matter. So no more, it's used more like a, like a stimulant than an actual metabolic aid where it's just like, it, you're just stimulating that, that adrenal response, that adrenaline production and sympathetic activity to get you going rather than using it to drive energy production. Yeah, And that's a big nuance with, with caffeine consumption. And the other thing I want to point out here really quick is that tolerance to caffeine is, can also be contextual and change over time for an individual. Mm -hmm. So that's something, if you start out and you're not doing well with it, make some of these other changes first, address your liver health in general, a whole host of these other situations. And then you may be able to find, oh, now I can tolerate half a cup or a cup of coffee in the morning and I'm fine. So like, it really depends on on the individual with that. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it was funny what you were mentioning as far as using coffee as a way to, to drive stress where a lot of people are actually using it as an aid to help them with their fast or to help them with their really intense exercise that they're doing fasted, where again, you were just further driving that stress, for, um, you know, even deeper. So in that case, definitely not, not an ideal situation, but yes, considering all of that tolerance is definitely individual and there's a lot of factors to consider there. So uh, yeah, but definitely one to, that I think is worth looking into for this situation. One other one that I wanted to mention before we talk about some of the pro-metabolic hormones is inosine, which has been shown to be protective in fatty liver situations by directly 
increasing the amount of energy available, directly increasing ATP. And in situations where ATP production has been impaired, it's able to restore that production and reverse the pathology, which uh, is, you know, some of these studies, they're looking specifically at the liver's ability or capacity to export the fat through the VLDL. And that process gets impaired, as we talked about with oxidative stress, as well as a lack of energy. And so the inosine is able to reverse that situation and restore the, the energy availability. So that's another one that is not used or not discussed as often, just in general, uh, as a supplement, but I think can be a pretty protective one uh, in terms of the liver and and also in other regard, just considering that it, it's pretty good at, at uh, increasing ATP, increasing energy, and decreasing the stress hormones as well through that mechanism. Yeah. I mean, I don't have much to add there. I think it just goes to the general pathology that we we're talking about was actually like an energetic or ATP deficiency at the cell. So yeah. correcting that with inosine could be something that would be helpful. So yeah, not too much more to add. Um, Unless you want to jump into to thyroid here, because it's like thyroid being kind of the thyroid hormone being the basis for the other steroid hormones, because thyroid hormone is what is driving the other steroid hormone production. But I guess we'll start at the top of the pyramid here, I guess, which would be with thyroid hormone, which has a whole host of possible beneficial effects in in fatty liver. Yeah. Yeah, and, and again, looking at the the broad general mechanisms and causes underlying fatty liver, when we're considering metabolism and you know, and thyroid, of course there's going to be a pretty strong relationship there. And you see it, you see an association, a good association between low thyroid activity or hypothyroidism and non alcoholic fatty liver disease, and of course every other metabolic issue. And that's because our thyroid is is basically the general governor of our metabolism. So you see, you see that relationship, and you also see that using thyroid hormone uh, helps to decrease the the fatty liver pathology. Of course, it is not as simple as just everyone should be using thyroid hormone. We want to be supporting our metabolism and thyroid function with everything that we've discussed as far as diet and lifestyle goes. Uh, but thyroid hormone can be a helpful adjunct to those things when used properly, which again is a whole episode in and of itself. But it's just worth mentioning this relationship and that thyroid hormone should be something that's that's considered i mean just anytime there's metabolic dysfunction i think it's it's not surprising considering what goes on as far as the medical industry and pharmaceutical industry however i think you could probably make the argument that prescribing thyroid hormone in place of many of the other medications that are prescribed for various metabolic diseases like diabetes and heart disease would be way more effective statins (laughs) yeah statins metformin all of those things Prescribing thyroid hormone would be a much better route uh, for for actually helping to reverse the pathology there. So, uh, yeah, you see that here as well. It's just not patentable. I think that's the biggest problem, right? That's why the like the study that I looked at for this because they they looked at at thyroid hormones effect specifically in fatty liver, and they talked. There's I have some notes here on it. It actually prevented and reversed hepatocytosis, so fatty liver. It decreased liver weight, decreased serum triglycerides, decreased lipid peroxidation, decreased liver injury, lowered AST and ALT, which are the liver enzymes. Um, and then it increased mitochondrial biogenesis, which is the formation of new mitochondria. It increased mitophagy of, or mitophagy, however you want to pronounce it, of damaged my, mitochondria, which is something that we talked about at one point in the pathology, where when there's not enough energy in the cell, the cell can't like break up those, those damaged mitochondria and then build new ones because, because of that energetic deficit. So, uh, the, they were talking about all these benefits of thyroid hormone. And then it was like, oh, we need this synthetic thyroid hormone analog that only works on one specific thyroid hormone receptor. It's like, or you could just use thyroid hormone. <laughs> that was kind of like, that was when, after I read the study, I was, what I was thinking, it's like, you could just use regular thyroid hormone. But I also want to touch on here with the thyroid hormone. Uh, in fatty liver or or I guess in fatty liver in general, you see that upregulation in triglycerides and you see the we talked about the need to export the fats from the liver in the form of VLDL, which eventually becomes LDL. The LDL receptor that's expressed on tissues is directly upregulated by thyroid. So what that means is those cells and tissues are going to pull in 
or take some of the fats that's stored in that VLDL and LDL. And then thyroid hormone pushes the cholesterol that those cells take up and the fats that those cells take up and then the, the carbohydrate that those cells take up into energy metabolism. So it's going to cause the cells to burn, to increase beta oxidation, increase glucose oxidation, and take the cholesterol and turn it into steroid hormones. So it does it by upregulating the LDL receptor and then also upregulating this protein called STAR, steroid acute regulatory protein, which functions with the, I think, the retinoid X receptor as well, which is dependent on vitamin A. It takes that cholesterol with the glucose vitamin A and then it turns it into a steroid hormone. This is directly shown or discussed in multiple levels of the research. And this is also something that both Danny Roddy and Ray have like outlined for people. I think Danny has a like very nice graphic on it. But so if you're having elevated cholesterol, elevated triglycerides, and you, the thyroid hormone will allow, will push it and allow the cells to use it. But at the same time, like you want to be able to make sure that the liver is able to export the fats and cholesterol at, that is producing. So it's important to have adequate choline. And you also want to make sure that the cells have adequate B vitamins to be able to oxidize the substrate. So that's why thyroid hormone isn't just like a cure. It has to be in the context, at, the, at least from my perspective, in the context of a solid diet with solid nutrition and supplements to it, if you require those supplements to rebuild nutrient stores so that you can adequately use the thyroid hormone. Because if you just hop on thyroid hormone and you still have a trash diet, you actually may be causing yourself more harm overall because, because you don't have the nutrients to process the fatty acids, the glucose to turn the the hormones into the cholesterol into steroid hormones to to move the fat out of the liver through VLDL. You're you're deficient in in choline, whatever it is. The it's or you have a glucose deficiency, right? Like you're not eating enough carbohydrate. You want to use thyroid hormone on a low carb diet. It just doesn't make too much sense. So just all things to keep in mind that the diet and the nutrient having enough nutrients and macro and micronutrients, which is your fat, your carbs, your proteins, your vitamins, and your minerals, having all of those as the baseline and then running something like thyroid hormone on top would, would be ideal. Wouldn't be just take thyroid hormone, solve all your problems. Although thyroid hormone can be very helpful. So. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think we've talked about that relationship in the past and, and I'll link back to those episodes, but yeah, it, uh, it is not going to make up for poor diet, poor lifestyle, all of those things. But when those things are in place, it can help to speed along the process of, of healing and regeneration. I did want to mention, so you talked about the mitophagy and, and also thyroid hormone has been shown to restore autophagy as well in, in liver pathology. And I know I've talked about how we don't want to be stimulating those things, you know, in terms of hormesis and all of that, which is still the case. And the fact that basically what we're seeing is that when there is pathology, when things are dysfunctional, we cannot carry out these adaptive processes that are happening in response to damage. So these things, we want them to be able to happen in response to damage, but we don't want to be doing the things that increase them, which is the damage and insult and inflammation in the first place. So that's the important piece to, to uh, have. And then if we are causing those that dysfunctional situation, we want to be able to adapt effectively with things like autophagy and mitophagy. And we can't do those without enough energy. So the thyroid hormone helps to restore those adaptive processes. But again, we don't want to have to do that. But if you're in a situation of, of fatty liver disease, then you're already at that point and you can re reverse it. But when you're in that situation, you'd rather be able to properly adapt to that, to that issue. What I, the, the mitophagy and autophagy that you're seeing there, from my perspective are you have, like, when you have this elevated reactive oxygen species in the fatty liver situation, and you start damaging the mitochondrial membranes and mitochondrial structure and all of its components, having mitophagy, which is the destruction of these damaged mitochondria to recycle some of the components that are left, I think is ideal if in this state, because you have a, you have a, it's like having a broken house. You want to be able to go and fix that house or having a broken generator, whatever it is you take out, you're going to take out the parts that you can still use, whether it's structure of the house, and you're going to replace the other broken parts that all requires energy. That's all important. Thyroid mm -hmm. hormone is helping this process along. It's not just stimulating mitophagy for the sake of stimulating mitophagy. It's like you have right. this pathology, this issue going on, and thyroid hormone is allowing you to effectively undergo this process to adapt to that problem. Now, that's an entirely different process of 
I'm going to go blow up the house. Or I'm going to go blow up my mitochondria so I can have mitophagy. It, it's like very different. It's like you have the damage, we're going to fix it versus I'm going to create damage so that I have to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, that is a good way to put it, which is yeah. what the people in favor of hormesis are suggesting that you want to create the damage to fix it. Yeah, to some extent. Uh, yes. Yeah, I don't think they know they're, they, they're seeing it through that lens. But that is kind of where we're like, yeah, that's kind of what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so beyond thyroid, there is some research looking at, or there's uh, a decent amount of research looking at testosterone in terms of fatty liver. We talked about vitamin E earlier, and there's quite a few studies looking at testosterone in combination with vitamin E being able to reverse fibrosis in you know, fatty liver disease and restore insulin sensitivity. Of course, this is with a drug that they're trying to patent uh, in you know the certain combination, but that is noteworthy as well as also I alluded to these earlier as far as the studies looking at testosterone and vitamin B1, thymine in combination, being able to reverse liver cirrhosis, which is that very severe form of fatty liver disease. And they this is this is research from I think the 60s and was something that they were looking at as something that was basically curing the situation. Uh, and so this is this does not mean that we just want to be taking in large amounts of testosterone. <laughs> Rather, A, that we want to do the things to support testosterone production on its own, just like we talked about with thyroid. Again, you, you have all the same issues, but also using certain supplements, including supplemental hormones that can increase testosterone production or androgenic activity could also be protective. Things like pregnenolone, DHEA, and some other steroid hormones would also potentially be effective in creating these same uh, in creating the same healing regenerative protective effect yeah and dhea by itself has also been shown to have some benefit but all of the idea would like i think a lot of the, the low testosterone state which you often see in fatty liver like some of the low sex steroid hormone states are pathologies caused by the endotoxemia so they have uh i think it's there was there's a couple of studies they're like the gelding studies which is like it was like gut derived endotoxin. I, I forget the specific like definition of the acronym, but they were just basically showing that endotoxin from the gut could directly lower sex steroid hormone production through like multiple mechanisms. Um, so the question is, why are these steroid hormones low? Not, not like, oh, they're low. Let's just replace all of them. Now, the, the, and there's a difference, right? Because your pregnenolone and your DHEA aren't going to, in most situations, based on the research, aren't going to completely shut down all of your steroid hormone production. Whereas taking large amounts of testosterone, what it, there's very likely you're going to shut down your own steroid hormone production. Mm -hmm. So these things can be helpful, of course. Um, the question is just why are they not there? And then how to use them in a way where you're not shutting down your own production and minimizing the side effects to exert the beneficial effects from them. And again, thyroid hormone is like the primary hormone driving the production of these steroid hormones. Um, and then also lowering glucocorticoids is also key in, in allowing for the adequate production of these steroid hormones and minimizing stress, minimizing gut drive endotoxin and optimizing sleep. All of those are key for lowering your glucocorticoids and raising thyroid function and raising these other adaptive or catatoxic, uh, they're not adaptive, the catatoxic or the sex steroid hormones, which are, which are generally protective. So it's like addressing the underlying issues underneath is the always, I think should be the first key is like, why, why is my testosterone low? How can I go about fixing that? Do I have a deficiency? Do I have endotoxemia? whatever is going on, are my glucocorticoid super high? Is my sleep bad? Addressing those factors and then considering, okay, if I used a little bit of DHEA and pregnenolone, if I was able to access a doctor and get smaller amounts of testosterone, would that be helpful? Would using thyroid hormone help me along to recovering from these situations? That's where like, I would come from adding some of those things in, not from like they're low replace them. It's a very, it's nuanced, but I think it's a very big difference overall. Absolutely. Yeah. I wanted to add in one other feature there uh, that would decrease the production of the sex steroids, which would also be oxidative stress. Of course, that goes yeah. with the inhibited respiration and all of that. But we pointed out in the past how vitamin E can protect against that effect, for example, with testosterone specifically in the testicles. 
which can allow for testosterone production when it's inhibited by oxidative stress. So, yeah. And we also talked about in, in other, uh, podcasts as well, that having high amounts of polyunsaturated fatty acids present in the test, in the testicles and testicular structure, decrease testosterone via oxidative stress, testosterone production. So not only is it causing that damaging effect at the fat, at the liver, it can also be causing the damaging effect at the the testicles and God knows where else in the body, the vasculature, the heart, um, the brain for all these different pathologies, whether it's heart disease, atherosclerosis, heart attacks, Alzheimer's, there's associations and possible mechanisms involved, or there's oxidative stress is implied in all of them. But Mm -hmm. as far as the, uh, the polyunsaturated fatty acids, I mean, there, you can't talk about oxidative stress without really talking about those. Yeah. 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 And that all comes back down to, again, establishing that diet first, making sure you're having that solid diet, changing the lifestyle, and then addressing and filling in the gaps with supplements. So it kind of all works together, but that foundation is extremely important with diet lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. All right. And before we wrap up this episode, I did want to clarify uh, as far as what we meant when we were discussing the use of thyroid hormone, where there are multiple different thyroid hormones, but in general, we recommend using a combination of T3 and T4 hormones, either synthetic or natural desiccated thyroid products that contain both hormones. Of course, before using uh, any hormones like that, definitely consult with a medical professional. And that is going to wrap up this non-alcoholic fatty liver disease series. If you did enjoy it and this episode, please leave a like or comment if you're watching on YouTube. And if you're listening elsewhere, please leave a review or five-star rating on iTunes. All of those things really do a lot to help support the podcast and are very much appreciated. To check out the show notes for today's episode, you can head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash podcast, where you can take a look at the studies and articles and anything else that we referenced throughout today's episode. And if you are dealing with any of the symptoms or conditions that we've been discussing throughout this series, whether that is fatty liver disease or insulin resistance or other related conditions like diabetes or heart disease, or if you're struggling with any low energy symptoms like chronic cravings and hunger, low energy or fatigue, chronic joint pain, weight gain, digestive symptoms, brain fog, poor sleep, or hormonal imbalances, or if you're dealing with any other low energy symptoms or chronic health issues, then head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash energy, where you can sign up for a free energy balance mini course, where I'll explain how these different symptoms and conditions are really caused by a lack of energy. And I'll also walk you through the main things that you can do from a diet and lifestyle perspective to maximize your cellular energy and resolve these symptoms and conditions. So to sign up for that free energy balance mini course, head over to jfeldmanwellness.com energy. And with that, I'll see you in the next episode.